All right, welcome, folks. Welcome to another 40k rant. Well, I say 40k rant. I think we're going to rant about a lot of things today, but 40k will be in there as well. Welcome back to the channel, Outer Circle, mate. It's an honor to have you here again. Thanks for having me on. Always no, fun time. No, yeah, it is. It is. And again, I'm quite glad we did this today. One of my lessons was cancelled because we always go over. We always just shoot the shit for a long, a long, long period. But I've got several questions i've been inundated with several questions uh because i asked my discord the other day uh, what, what was going on and what kind of questions they wanted to ask you and i had a few that i filtered out and i thought okay well we won't use some of them because it's all about mold lines and things and i don't want to send you down that journey of you just bile and anger about I, I, but i will i'm sick of buying these model sets i've literally gotten <laughs> gotten a primaris set how this company, Games Workshop, is worth so much money, but I've got to sit here with a hobby knife for hours removing mold lines is beyond me. Maybe you can talk me through a process before we start on why that keeps happening and why I keep getting these sets that look like they're made by a five-year-old. Well, look, it's a limitation of the design medium, unfortunately. You're going to get the mold lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, is how you mitigate them. So where you put the joint in the miniature so that you don't get those mold lines. And Games Workshop has a very bad habit of putting them in the areas that are most frustrating, like where someone has hair or yeah. in the middle of a shoulder pad, you know, somewhere really, really obvious. Uh, a great example of that is the injection points. Uh, so the point where uh, plastic enters into the die and then enters into the various parts, right? The little tabs that you cut off. So those points on things like backpacks, they always put them, like especially in Heresy, on the top of the backpacks. Mm. Well, everyone sees those. Put them on the underside. Mm -hmm. If you can get away with it. Because, I mean, Flow, and um, I, they might do this at Games Workshop, but you can run Flow simulations to see how the plastic's going to flow through the die. Um, but it's important to remember that plastic is cooling the second it hits that die. Right? And when it's cooling it's going to shrink and this is going to cause issues especially if it's something that's very fine detail um, or very small because the plastic is trying to fill a very small cavity but at the same time it's hardening and it just ends up choking it off so large simple features obviously are easier to cast but we were talking earlier today um, uh, friends of mine that like Weedham and um, Jackson that and we were talking about how in my opinion, there's no, like, cheap low entry bar. And it's just amazing to me with Games Workshop that you have a company here that's, you know, you think they would understand marketing a lot better than they do. Because I'd be trying to make the most basic units uh, the cheapest possible thing in the world. I wouldn't be trying to make any profit on them. You know, almost like a start collecting set should just be, like, a $10 kit. Because you, you get that sort of, uh, like, a gambler's hand like, once they're in, they're in, you know? They're incentivized now to keep spending because they've made their first transaction. It's like microtransactions online. I would be happy for people starting the game to have monopose marines. Like, you remember the, like, second ed, third ed yeah, um, plastic marines? Yep. You know, just a very, very basic pose with just literally just a bolt gun onto the front and the back. In fact, I think the bolt gun was molded on in many cases. Yep. Um... Yeah, okay, they're not the greatest looking miniatures in the world, but they don't have to be for someone who's entering the hobby. And, you know, it's a lot less daunting than what we get, which is the worst of both worlds, in my opinion, which is models that are complex, weirdly posed, still have multiple parts you have to cut and put together, and you're, you've still got to clean them up, you've still got all of that, but they're not cheaper either for it. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. You like, know? The one thing, one thing that really you know, grinds my girdle, so to speak, is that I collect Grey Knights and Space Marines, right? So I, I get I get old and new models alike, and I combine the two. One thing I have noticed is with the Grey Knight models, the and compared to the new Primaris models, the mold lines have gotten worse, not better. So the old Grey Knight models are from 20-odd 20, 20 years ago, right? These, these are really, really, really old pieces of kit. But the new like Primaris Marines, especially the Assault Marines, the, the brand new from the Leviathan box set and from elsewhere, they the mold lines are down the back of the legs. 
the back of the arm piece on the legs. The, the really the flattest part of the model, aside from the shoulder pads, apart from the pauldrons, is the back of the legs, and that's where the mold lines are. And also, they've got this lovely detail on the back of where the two parts fit together on the on the back of the on the back of the shin on the calf. And you don't want to lose that detail, but the mold line runs specifically over that detail. And so you've got to be really careful about cutting it away and filing it away to not lose that really shallow detail that's there. It's like they've, they've looked at the model and said, where's the worst place we can put this mold line? And just and done that. And I, I cannot see for the life of me why. And on the shoulder pads as well, it's at the top uh, points left and right of the shoulder pad as well. Um, sorry, the backpack. I don't get how old Grey Knights that are on similar sprues... All of their mold lines, there's one or two that are a bit awkward, but most of them are in places where you can naturally either ignore them with a good undercoat of dark colours, or you can just scrape them off and you're not going to lose any sort of you know, detail at all. I don't get how it's gone backwards, and that's what irks me about these new sets. I don't understand that at all. It just, you know, and as you said, it, it, the process is its own thing, and it's about how to mitigate them because you're always going to get them. But I'd love to know. I and it's never going to happen. But I would love someone from Games Workshop to explain how this occurs <laughs> because I just don't get it. Well, again, it's a limitation of the medium, but also, uh, you know, they don't have to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's the, at the end of the day. Unfortunately, with many Games Workshop decisions, they don't have to justify it. They don't have to do what is best for the customer because uh, well we're going to reward them anyway to some extent with our cash shall we um dive into these questions then because that was my own before we even got started i, I cheated i jumped in there <laughs> so <laughs> that's fine the horror heresy storyline is over for in book form anyway it's over all right what are your takeaways from this almost 20 year journey Good question. Um, hmm. The Siege of Terror and especially the last couple of books feels like Peter Jackson's The Hobbit films. Mm. It's uh, like a bloated, stretched out mess that uh, I think especially the Siege of Terror and what happens on Horace's ship should just be left to our imagination because I don't think the actual fulfillment of that story uh, is strong enough to justify it, its existence do you reckon they could have um, done that though like I, I i honestly don't think they could have done that and gotten away with it i think there would have been you know people marching in the streets if they hadn't covered like the, the, the siege of terror and the, the battle on the bridge and stuff you know do you reckon they could have got, got away with that if they'd have done it right uh like a comedian having a really good show uh exit on a high and uh leave them wanting more you know mm. i suppose yeah i mean yeah uh, carry on sorry yeah i interrupted no, no, it's it's that's my own personal take on it. You know, I think the series as a whole was at its strongest when it was fleshing out the unknown. Once it started delving into uh, like the author's insert of the week, like it started following a completely unrelated to the heresy character or you know that cabal crap. Oh god! You know, when it when it started going down those routes, that was when it was at its least interesting for me. So a, a Primark book like Perturabo's Primark novel is still one of my favourites in the series, or Path of Heaven, uh, the original Horus books, um, like Horus Rising. First three, yeah. Uh, yeah, th those sort of books where it's like introduction to this world, to these characters, um, to the, the way that it's so different, a timeline to what 40k is, that was all fantastic. But when it just revolves into here is yet another book, here is yet another anthology, and it doesn't have anything to say. It doesn't yeah. bring anything to the table. I think for that's me, when I, I. Sorry, mate. Go on. I was just gonna say. I think it overstayed its welcome. Yeah, I, I think for for me the the um, the book Nemesis was one of the first where I went. Hang on. We know this doesn't succeed. So why are we wasting our time following these assassins who are going to go and try and kill Horus? Because we there's literally no point to telling the story at all. Like you, you're right. Maybe you tell the origins of the of the Officio Assassinorum. Okay, do we need to know that in Horus Heresy, or can we do that in another book away from the series? You know, 
I think when they started making decisions like that, or making decisions where they let, um, where they let writers write perfectly fine books, like um, Descent of Angels, perfectly fine book, it, but it's not, you can't follow on the first three novels that were really good on Flight of the Eisenstein as well. With this, I, I think Sons of Selenar is probably the worst. That's for that. the worst, yeah. That's the worst. Yeah, um, you know, and also uh, Wolfsbane. Wolfsbane was pretty bad as well because it spends so much time with the character of Belisarius Call. Yeah, uh, who I've got problems with, but what well, this is not my bias talking. It's a his actions in the Horus Heresy. Mm. They're really irrelevant yeah. to telling the story of the Horus Heresy. You know, it's like just. It's like if you're watching Lord of the Rings and we just started following gambling around in Helm's Deep. <laughs> like, ignore Aragorn, ignore Gimli, you know. We're just following, like, um, gambling around as he's just passing on, like, Theoden's just, you know, orders to people. Mm. Just like, yes, the king needs a uh, needs another cup of mead uh, to keep him going, you know. Yeah. Um, we need uh, three bricks put over there, please. With a malt loaf. <laughs> you know, it would just be the most... Yeah, it would just be the most dull thing. And they introduce a character like Belisarius Call to be like, look, this is his origin story. Yeah. It's like, look, are you telling us a story about how Russ tries to assassinate Horace, or are you telling us a story about Belisarius Call? I think that's, please that's, pick one. That's exactly. I mean, the, the strength of Belisarius Call for me. I've, I, I just finished reading uh, Gene Father, and um, the the strength of his character is in forty k, like because he he's a great character. Like he his scenes. There's one scene. Spoilers, by the way. Uh, there is one scene in in that novel where um, it's not really plot relevant, but it, it, he's talking to another version of himself, and it's it's like a Monty Python sketch. It's really funny. It, it's it's empirically funny. It would be funny in any show. It'd be, it, if it was in Red Dwarf, you'd be chuckling along. This is really funny, and you know it, it, it's it's got a serious connotation to it of what's going on in the scene, but it always has the underlying. Oh, this is what calls like. He's he's a chill guy. I like this guy, but every single time I read about him in the Horus Heresy, I'm sort of thinking, well, that's fine. I mean, but you're only here because you changed the story twenty years after you originally started the story. Like that's the the it's to tie you into this thing. You've got no relevancy within. You are there to create the Primaris Marines for good or bad. Doesn't matter. You know they're here now. Do we really need to know that they were being worked on at the time? I mean, I would have worked in the Primaris Marines into the Raven Guard and them losing their gene seed and having all that stuff stolen from them. You know, having the Emperor give the 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 Primarch gene seed templates to um, Cor Corvus Corax, who then loses them to the Alpha Legion, and then that's where we get the the Primaris from. That'd be really interesting. But we we went with this um, again, bloated, unnecessary. That. For, Horribly, that's about eighty percent of the Horus Heresy, and I was really surprised when I did a. I know you've not not um, you've not been that into them, the Siege of Terror books, but when I did the review of the Siege of Terror, the last two books, the End and the Death, and I did the first one, uh, it was essentially um, it was pulling together all of the different disparate parts and finishing them off. You know what I mean? And the horrible thing is there there were so many plates spinning that certain plates got a, a quarter of a chapter to finish, and that was it. That's the last time you saw them. Loken was one of them, where you're like, oh, there's Loken fighting. Not even named, he's just there, um, and he's described, and he's fighting, and that's it. And it's kind of like, oh, that, I, I guess that's Loken then. Great. That's the one character I was interested in seeing, because we've got so many of these redundant characters. Um, another thing that I wanted your opinion on, by the way, is what is your opinion on the norm, the normal people, the norms getting airtime in the Horus Heresy, like itself? As in, you know, guardsmen, uh, you know. There's there, there is a place for it. the The place for it is to. It's the fish out of water. Mm. Um, it's a bit of an audience insert when you're put into the perspective of a marine or a primarch. You're being put into that superhuman's perspective. And the way they make sense of the situation is very different to a uh, regular human, you know, whose reflexes are so much slower, who are far less protected, don't have all these extra organs. Uh, and so they're quite a fragile being, being surrounded by this absolute carnage. And that can be very useful, I think, as a narrative element when it's used correctly, because it's like they can watch what's going on around them. You know, if you're, if you imagine if you're a human standing there and then just 
uh, a unit of loyalists, a unit of trader marines just charge into one another with chain swords, and you're so insignificant to them. None of them even bother to swing at you or protect you. You're just an obstacle in the way, you know, like mm. like humans treat insects. Mm. You know, that's the appropriate way I think to use most most basic humans. You know, there are certain mortals that you know play a bigger part in the story along the way, but that is the best use for them when they start having a lot of character agency and it's not just one or two real key models it's when you start getting like five or six then it starts to add to this already you know incessant bloat and although these stories are character driven you know look at the narrative change in when we look at a book like um first heretic or uh fulgrim or uh, Galaxy in Flames, and the way they portray the Istvan battles, Istvan 5 is pretty much not touched. We get very little Istvan 5. We just get the key moments of that battle presented to us. And people love those books. But when we got to the Siege of Terror, they couldn't give us key moments. It had to be these long, drawn-out narratives. Like, take, a, was it First War? Yeah. Where we had that, like, regiment that get that african regiment or whatever that gets followed around for chapter after chapter and then it's just it's over with you know like yeah. it, it's, it's so weird decisions i, I like will that. say i know you've not read the last two it gets worse like the, like in in the end of the death part one it was literally there were literal whole chapters given over to people that you know are dead you, you, you know generally there's no their hair is falling out the teeth are falling out and you're just like you're all okay and you've just you've just had the scene where you've had Sanguinius giving a rousing speech to the troops at the front of the Eternity Gate, and you're ready to run through a brick wall. That's when you pull the trigger and you go to Horace's flagship. You know that that's when you do that. You you do it then. Everyone's ready to go. The reader's ready to go, and instead you you, you start following a, an old man around a library for a while. It's like it's like well, what the pacing's all off. Like I, and people were saying to me, look, you're not getting it. Like you, you're not. We need to um, finish off these these stories, and and I think what people weren't understanding was is that that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying leave these stories untold. I'm saying tell them in their own novella, tell them in their own anthology book or whatever you need to do, but do not, do not screw up the pacing of the central conflict of the entire series. To tell me about an old man walking around a library looking for a book that doesn't. You know, I, and and it just, I just, it was, it was the Horus Heresy as, a, as it, the entire thing in two books. It was literally this. These are the problems with the Horus Heresy. These were the problems that have been happening the entire time, and there couldn't have been a better example of Dan Abnett frantically, and I mean frantically, you know, stopping all of the spinning plates and going right. That one's done. That one's done. That one's done. That one's done. And not being and not being able to just say you can tell but the way he's writing it he's skipping through a lot of stuff with the non-humans because he doesn't want to write about them he's like no I'm, I'm done i don't want to write about these guys i mean he made john grammaticus and that's the only guy who gets the, the full airtime is john grammaticus and his leading alpharius or whoever it is into the golden throne play and i'm just like <sighs> and and the end of that story is him standing in front of the golden throne and the emperor saying not yet when they go to switch off the throne that's it that's the story and I'm just like, right. So, what was the what was the point of that? And and why why can't we? The original story of of Horace and the Emperor was that a, a random guardsman walks in and distracts Horace, you know, for a split second. And it's a heroic thing to do, and it's it's great because it shows the 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 heroism of the Imperial Guard and how they don't give a shit. It, it shows the absolute. Um, you know, dog-headedness of humans. To, to, that's why we're the best because we do shit like that. An Eldar wouldn't do that. Do you know what I mean? Like an Eldar wouldn't. Do, you know, this guy knows he's going to die in the most horrific way. But he knows he can't make any difference whatsoever. But he does it anyway because he's just a normal guy going up against Horus. He doesn't care. Um, but now we've got it. It's it's a perpetual doing it, or 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 it's a saint doing it, or it's and I'm just or it's custodies even worse. Like, what was the point? It's just, it's just well look you know. what we spoke about when we spoke about the Harris series as a whole it just lost sight of the narrative path yeah. you know it had point a to point b 
Horus turns traitor. Horus dies at the hands of the Emperor, who is also mortally wounded. Mm -hmm. And there's a straight through line to get us from point A to point B. And they just diverged. And wherever the author's fancy took them, I think that the, whoever, you know, was involved in the decision-making process just said, yeah, let's do it. Like, mm. who cares? You know, we'll, we'll be able to sell it or whatever. You know, just, you got any short stories? Let's chuck them in an anthology. You know, and it should there should have been a, a straight line series that just went from that point A to point B. You know, just these are the traitor legions, this is how they fell, these are the loyalist legions, here's a few key battles, Siege of Terror, done. Yeah, I'm and talking then here there. is the yeah. yeah, and here's your like um companion series. Here's the Primark novel series, and here's like your um Tales in the Age of Darkness series or something, mm. you know or Tales of the Horus Heresy, and it's like an anthology and all these other, like, random books and novellas you can set in that universe. And they're their own thing, and they're supplemental items. Because if you're a reader and you want to, um, you know, read the Horus Heresy novel series and you want to start now, it is going to take you years yeah. to read through them all. This is not like picking up Lord of the Rings. It's not like picking up Game of Thrones you know, and, and like, oh, yeah, there's four or five novels to get through. It's like, no, there's like 50 novels to get through. Yeah. And you miss one anthology. You won't remember who so many different characters are because there's way too many characters introduced in the Horus Heresy. Uh, characters who are not pivotal at all. You get to a book like um, uh, Master of Mankind where you get introduced to this, this knight household who... Uh, worked with the Emperor's children at one point. Yeah, I remember And this. because the Emperor's children have gone traitor, they suspect mm -hmm. this night house has gone traitor, and they have to prove themselves, and then they end up going into the webway to prove themselves alongside the other Imperial forces, and, and then they die in battle. Mm -hmm. It's like, so hang on, you've introduced me to these characters, you've, you've given me this whole narrative backstory about who they are and what they're about, and then it didn't mean anything in the end. They didn't stop... Like, their death didn't stop the webway from being closed off, you know? It hasn't... Didn't buy the Emperor time, really, or anything like that. No. So, I don't know. You know, yeah. and, and there's just so much of that. One thing I want to agree with you on is that certain things need to be left untold. Uh, there were certain points in, in The End and the Death where I literally was cooking tea or, or, or I was doing something and listening to it, and I had to stop and go, wait, that was it? That was that moment that I've heard about for 30 years. That was it. You know, there was one where they realized that Horace's shields are down. And it's literally Malkador standing in front of the Emperor having a fucking aneurysm. And he's just like, oh, God, will you just wake up? And he's getting annoyed at the Emperor not waking up. And the Emperor finally pulls his mind and he's showing him Horace's flagship without talking, obviously, because he's doing a million things at once on the Golden Throne. And he's like, look, you know, look. And he's like, yeah, I am looking. There's nothing there. Look. There, no, no, look, what's different? And the end, the end, he goes, oh, the shields are down. I guess we can attack now. And then we're on to the next scene. And I'm like, that was one of the pivotal things in, in that, that mythical white dwarf article back in the day when they talked about the Horus Heresy and, and it was like a, a breakdown of what it was. It was kind of like a little book in itself. And that was one of the pivotal lines when the Emperor and Malkador are sitting there and they're going, wait, hang on, you know, I, I sense that his shields are down, and they have, like, this philosophical discussion about, okay, so, what do we do? Like, I, do I go up there? And the Emperor's, like, doesn't really know, because he didn't foresee this. Like, this is the thing. Like, like, like in, in the White Dwarf article, he was like, I, I don't know, like, do I go up there? Or, I didn't see this. I know Gilliman's on his way. Like, what, what do we do? And it was, like, an incredible thing, and to, to have that reduced to, oh, yeah, the shields are down. I guess what, I'll go get the Primarchs then, we'll go. Yeah, it's fine. That just, I just had to stop the recording and go, and was that it, Jonathan Keeble? Was that, is that what we just did with that, with, that, with that moment? And there was so many other moments where I was just like, um, you know, Gilliman uh, teleporting onto the Vengeful Spirit and then being lost in a in a desert for thousands of years, literally. Like, so, so, he, he, so he ages thousands of years in this desert and, and then finally gets back onto the Vengeful Spirit and I'm just like, did we need two chapters of that? Of him walking around and seeing things rust away? And, and, and no? I mean, 
I just, <laughs> I just stopped. There were, there were way, there were some baffling decisions that I just thought, wow, okay, like we're, we're stopping the narrative now, and we're stopping it because you need this to be in two or three books, and it is three books now, by the way. They're doing it in three books, not two, which is again the horror series series in a nutshell is that they, they were going to do it in one book, then two books, and now three books, and it's just, it's too much. For me, I'm not going to read the third book. I, it's just going to let me down. Um, I'm at the end of the end of the second one now, and I'm just like, okay, um, no, <laughs> like I'm not doing this anymore. I can't. I don't want you to ruin more moments for me, and I, and I don't want you to ruin Horace and the Emperor going toe to toe. Because how are you going to write that? It'll be the same issue as when they wrote when John French wrote Titanicus or Titan Death. Um, there are certain things about Titans that we just you just can't put onto paper, you know. The, the majesty and the size of these things you can't put it on it never comes across you know you can't just describe it one of the best things i've seen of titans there's this free video on youtube go and look at it if you're on the video um and it is is an audio clip of what a titan sounds like and it is terrifying like you can literally hear its footsteps and sirens going off and you can hear it it, it, it sort of sees the people who are shooting at it and spools up its city killing gun and fires it and then just walks off and it's the most terrifying thing you've ever heard and I've heard some shit and that made that it, I've even getting my hairs are standing up now on my arm like thinking about it you can't get that across in a book there were certain things that you completely write where they, sh they should should just left it alone L have the titans be over there and be really cool and don't describe more of more of them because you can't do them justice. Um, I don't know. W would you say so to close this off? Would you say that the horror heresy has been a net positive or a net negative for the overall experience of 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 that timeline in forty k oh, and in thirty k? Now that it's its own thing, w what would you say the big takeaway is? Is it a net positive or a net negative? I think it's a net positive. Uh, it just could have been better. Mm. Yeah, good, good way to put it. Good way to put it. All right. Um, secondly, and then this one's going to be quite interesting. Uh, uh, it's just a, it's a statement which I quite like, so I just copied and pasted it because I thought it was really funny. Um, ask him about the absolute state of Games Workshop's business model. Go full stop. <laughs> and it's just off you go. All right. <laughs> Chapter one. Yeah. Uh, no, I. I did a video on Games Workshops um, as a company and what I would change, like fixing Games Workshops, what I called them. And I put out that video because I really want to, you know, move away from just the, the negative side of things because I'm like, I'm all about consumer advocacy and trying to look after players, but I didn't want to end up just constantly being just the broken record of, yep, they stuffed it up again. Yep, they stuffed it up again. Yep, they stuffed it up again. Not everything they put out is bad. The problem is that the way they put things out is by the shotgun approach, throwing enough shit at the wall and hoping that some of it sticks, especially through the use of you know those tactics like FOMO and hype and all of that, as opposed to just, you know, as opposed to sitting down and just nutting out an addition of each game and balancing it and constantly updating it and tweaking it and giving it 10 years to sit. They're like a kid with ADHD. <sighs> they can't sit still. They can't just go, all right, we're going to make the best edition of 40K and we're going to yeah. FAQ it constantly and we're going to end up with a really good edition. Instead, they build an edition and then as they start releasing books, every book is made more powerful than the last one half of the time. The other half of the time, it's weaker. There's very few cases where it's like, yep, this is perfectly balanced and fits in well. Because they don't understand their own game system. And this is true for every game system. Mm. And as they push on through, they basically get three, four years down the line. They go, what we've created is an absolute mess. Uh, rather than, you know, tweaking this system and releasing new versions of these books, let's just make a whole new edition of the game. And even if they don't need a new edition of the game, like I think Age of Sigma version 2 is a good example of this. Age of Sigma version 2, I think, had a few faults, but was a really, really solid system. Mm -hmm. 
and it just needed, you know, an FAQ here and FAQ there. They just released in the middle of COVID as well, like his Age of Sigma 3. It was just a bolt from the blue because corporate had decided, no, this is the time for it, FOMO, whatever it might be. And I don't think it did that well either, that release, but um, because of when they did it. Was that and the, uh, Dominion when they do these there? releases, yeah, yeah. When they, okay. when they do these releases though, they don't think, um, like they don't look at it and go, okay, what didn't work? What was wrong with the last edition? Let's fix that. Mm. Instead, like with Heresy 2, they, they go, let's start changing things. Let's start messing with the mechanics that no one complained about. And then you get half the time people will say, this is great, I love these new mechanics because you've flicked the, you know, you've played my trap card, which is nostalgia. And, you know, I feel like you're bringing back like second edition mechanics or something, right? Second edition 40K mechanics have been brought back or individual movement stats. And the same people will tell you that by adding all of these new mechanics, you're somehow still streamlining the game at the same time, and it becomes a mess, right? Mm -hmm. And the other half of people will be out here going, that wasn't broken. You know, this is usually the camp I sit in going, that wasn't broken. Why did you fix that but left this? Yeah. <laughs> left this a fucking mess, you know? And the way they just approach it, and instead of being a company who's like, we want to deliver a great service... And have people coming back to us time and time again uh, and acknowledging that we've done such a good job looking after them. They want to buy from us no matter what it is. Instead, they just try and throw so many things at you and just get you like like hyped up. Like, you know, slapping each other on the back before a rugby game or something, you know, um, for every release. And you see it all the time. People go and they buy this stuff, but they don't hold on to it. Mm. It's very hard to create a system and and build a stable system and and get people retained in the system and in a place like the uk where it's a lot more geographically um condensed it's not so bad but when you come to a place like australia much smaller population we're a third of the uk's population nearly spread out over an area that's you know 20 times the size of the uk's area if there's a game system that's being pushed on you through this FOMO hype games model and you're trying to get other people into it, well, if even if you have the money, people have a choice now. Do they, you know, as a as games group, all drop money on this new game and hope that you stick with it as a games group because these are the only people you're probably going to play regularly? Or do you just pay for what's existing already? And I think that's what's really hurting Games Workshop in Australia is people are hesitant to adopt new systems because they're like there's so few players in my geographic location unless we want to start driving you know an hour two hours three hours away mm. it's just not sustainable and they don't care about any of that sort of thing when they could be using things like better retail stores uh, this is not a dig at the retail staff who i think do a really good job with the resources they're given but like stores should be your entry point you know i talk about this a lot in the video is that that is that should be like an Apple store. This is trying to sell you an upmarket product. It should look professional. It should smell nice. It should look clean. It should be an introduction to all things hobby and, you know, actually build those communities, encourage people to buy these different games rather than just trying to hit them with hype and FOMO, you know. And probably on top of all of that is cross-platform um, tie-ins. When they released something like uh, Battlefleet Gothic, you know, there was no Battlefleet Gothic tabletop game. Yeah. They released Total Warhammer. There's no Warhammer Square They completely square base. missed that boat. That's gone. Yeah. They, they, and you could see the, um, with Total War Warhammer now, the, 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 the wind has turned against it because of the DLC practices that they've, they've involved. By the way, all Creative Assembly have done is take a leap out of Games Workshop's book. So, you know, go figure. But like, I the, guess the wrong lesson was learnt by the wrong company. Exactly, yeah. It seems like they've they've gone and the, the tide has turned against Warhammer uh, uh, Total War now. People are sick of it. They don't want it anymore. Um, they think DLC practices are really shitty. They don't really... The, the player counts well down. And Games Workshop announced the old world years late and have done nothing with it since. 
which just makes me think. And, and not, you know. not only that, though. Um, sorry. For, no, go, 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 go. Um, but, you know, you, you think about that. Like, with, with those releases, they say in their investor report what they think the greatest risks of the company are. They don't talk about things like that. That's actual areas where they, you know, fucked it as a company. They, they royally screwed it up. And they don't talk about it. Instead, they try and, you know, like all good corporate papers, try and just point to something that's a non-issue. You know, like if um, you're going for a job interview and they say, you know, what's bad about you? And you're like, oh, I'm too punctual. You know, <laughs> like, like yeah. you just give them some like BS fault, some BS flaw that's not true. They're like, oh, well, you know, we don't want our, um, our lower management and middle management to get um, too complacent. It's like, really? That you think is your problem? Mm. You know, it's so out of touch. And you look at something like Warhammer the Old World, um, this is my inner cynic, so be prepared, audience. But these lazy fucking cunts mm. mm -hmm. could have shit that game out in a weekend mm -hmm. because they don't balance and play test these things anywhere near as much as they like to pretend they do. These books are always full of flaws when they come out. But what's worse is the core rules of the system were already there in 8th edition. And you can even go and look at all the fan-written uh, versions of 9th edition fantasy. Or go back and look at 6th and 7th edition Warhammer fantasy. The building blocks are there. So if you're not changing the building blocks too much, why is there a three-year development cycle? Especially when you compare it with the fact that they're just, apart from a few characters, re-releasing the old miniatures did you see uh, rick priestley's comments about old world about when he the they he was asked on uh another youtube channel i think i'll put it in the description down below um the video but he was he, he was asked whether he was invited back or asked to do anything even though he's part of world world games now to go and do something for old world and he said he he hadn't been asked he'd asked them he'd gone to games work and said look do you want i can do this in, in a as you said like in a in a fucking weekend you give me a weekend, I can give you Warhammer again, you know, as it was. You know, modern, but, you know, with all the things that I've learned through the industry in the time, and I can give you a game that's going to sell really well, and you can do with it what you will. You can pay me, obviously, but you can do with it what you will. And they turned him down flat. Like, flat turned him down. And it's just... Um, I've never seen a company be so successful despite being allergic to making the right decisions. Um, and on a point you mentioned before about the, the game not really being um, streamlined. I recently played a, a 1,500 point game of 10th edition with a good friend of mine, and he's pretty new to the to the edition itself. And I've I've only played like maybe uh, maybe a dozen games now. And a 1,500 point game to me should take us around an hour and a half, two hours. It took us five hours, five hours to do five turns. And it was perfectly fun, don't get me wrong, because I was playing with a, with a guy I liked and, and I knew we know each other really well. But in a tournament scene, in a, in a store, where you're just playing a new friend, a new guy, you're both done. Like, by the end of it, you just want to go home. Like, we, you don't want to go out, you don't, want to, you don't want to discuss it, you just want to go and boil your head. And it's not yeah, simplified. It's, it's, it's not. Like, they, they, it's, they marked it. It's it, that it's game not. three syndrome, right? Like game three at an event, you play like a two day tournament or event. By the end of game three, you're just you're knackered. Done. You're done. You, you don't want to do anything. You just want to sit down, go have a shower. Yeah. You know, wash the nerd funk off. You just want to like get into a field position down, and, and have just, a cold you know? beer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I just, I've started playing one page rules, and people are going to get sick of me talking about them because they're not perfect, right? Um, and, and I never say they are. They're not. No, no rule system is perfect, and it's not perfect. But what it does do when I finish a game of OPR, I want to play again, right? And I'm playing with a similar amount of models that I do with Warhammer. I'm playing with, you know, um, I think I think the game itself is smaller than 40k, like in terms of model count, because they want people to be able to do it pretty quickly. Um, but you play like a 3,000 point game of OPR. That's basically a 2,000 point game of 40k. And it will take you two and a half hours. And alternating... One of the big things about fatigue in 40k for me is the lack of alternating activations for me. It, it's the industry standard now for a reason and why Games Workshop are so adverse to actually uh, embracing it because they didn't do it 
it just right gets me right up, gets my back right up. Because a I'll, game... I'll tell you what it is. Oh, go on, yeah, go on. Well, it's 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 really simple. What Games Workshop has done is, as time has progressed in their game systems, in order to make each faction stand out from one another, they've introduced more special rules. So in early editions of all versions of all their games, um, but specifically Warhammer Fantasy and One Forty Thousand, the and 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 actually Lord of the Rings as well. This fit applies to stats were the decider. Your raw stats, as presented on the tabletop, were what most of the game revolved around. And special rules were very, very, you know, far between. Like, and they shall know no fear was one of the most core special rules for the longest time in Warhammer 40,000. Now, every unit has special rules, and there are special rules that apply army-wide based on your faction, your allegiance, whatever it might be. And there are more rules that come into play that are just floating in the air, be it command points or strategy points or whatever else you want to call them, that are just plucked out of the sky and then apply yet more special rules. And there are overlapping special rules and aura effects. And these are the things that have caused the bloat because you're not just taking into consideration the raw stats now, you're having to take in all these other external factors and work out how they all interplay with one another and explain them and because they're not just fixed in place, they're not static fixed in time, they're constantly evolving and changing as units go in and out of coherency with one another. And as you use those command points and stratagems and reactions and whatever other crap you want to pull out, that's the bloat. That there is, is like, I couldn't condense the problem down any finer than mm -hmm. that. Mm. I think, I think... Well, thank you for for. Like, I, I sometimes find it hard to put these things into my own brain because, as somebody who writes a lot, uh, you know, I'm quite used to being very formulaic in thought. So having somebody just break it down that that simply for me was, was really good. So thank you. Um, and on the flip side as well, um, you know, alternating activations for me, what they save is one person in in 40k standing there, and I think the, the where fatigue comes from is less from the game taking a long time and more from you literally being passive for more than 60% of the game time. You know, you're, you're standing there watching somebody else do stuff for a while. And it's not very interesting stuff that they're doing. They're rolling dice and they're standing there droning on about AP and inches and things. Um, you know, uh, and in... OPR, you're not doing that. You, you, I move, you move. I shoot, you shoot, and and you're 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 telling this story together. It's very collaborative, and it's very fast paced, and you're always needing to stay on your toes and be very aware of what's going on. There are very few gotchas because I think most of the gotchas in 40k, they come from fatigue. They don't come from the rules. They come from you being so fatigued with the game that you forget what's going on, and you just stop caring and and something slips through the net right because you just you just want to get the turn over with you just want to get their turn over with so when they say oh do you want to do this do you, you end up going no 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 no, it's fine and you move on when you're engaged in the game and you're there and, and it's a very quick snappy quick fire game back and forth you need to be on your toes and, and and looking at what's going on at all times and that makes their turn interesting because you need to know whether that character is going to move off that objective or whether and instead of sitting there for an hour and a half waiting for the answer to that question it happens in real time right in front of you and it's one of those uh, i i know you've got a, a tremendous point there in what you said about why they do this but i'm still going to say there's no reason why they should stick to it you know what i mean if you want to fix 40k the one of the main things you do for me is you is you make alternating activations a thing and you quicken up you take you strip out a load of these ridiculous special rules that people don't need because in OPR every faction plays differently. Every every faction has its own two or three special rules that make it play really differently to everybody else. Um, even different Space Marine chapters in OPR play differently to everybody. Else. If you can manage that, your game's good, right? If you can make the Space Wolves play differently to the Blood Angels, even though they're very similar in what they do, that's great. That, that that shows me you've got you've got the game down pat, and that's what they do. So, again, it it, it might be me being an old fuddy duddy and not being able to stand up for four hours anymore. But I just can't. I just can't with tenth anymore. Have you played any games of tenth yet? 
No, it doesn't interest me in the least. No, um, don't blame you. Probably because of the setting, but you know, and I look at I look at like Horus Heresy Second Edition is you know that's where my head's at for most things. Is I look at it and I'm like I'm happy to sit around and do nothing for a whole like turn and just take photos of the game and other people's armies and go chat with people around the event. And, you know, I, I'm happy to trust my opponent to just do the right thing, right? I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. care if I win or lose, mm -hmm. you know? I, but, you know, and, and but pay them respect as well. I'm not going to just walk off on them and not have of them. Of course, like, yeah. I'll just say, you know, do you mind if I go off and just, and and usually person's doing the movement phase and they, they don't care. They're just doing the movement phase. Mm -hmm. They don't care if you walk away. Um, but the, the gotcha situation you know, is that result of they won't commit to doing an I go, you go. So it's like this bastardized middle ground of, well, I'm going to play my trap card now. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's the most unsatisfying version it's of horrible. both worlds. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, and, and it can, it can be fine and it can be, you know, sometimes it's not detrimental to the gameplay. Perfectly happy to accept this, but on the whole, I think it is detrimental to the gameplay. And, I'm not a big fan of, you know, like the reactions and, and the stratagems, the command mm. points and, you know, and with that special rules boat that I was talking about, like the legions in Heresy 1 all felt distinct from one another because they had legion rules mm. and they had legion war gear and legion special units and some legion special characters and primarchs. That's a lot of divergence yeah. there. And, and you but don't now need, with the addition like, of... Yeah, you don't need that, that bigger change. Those are small changes that allow vastly different play styles in, in Horus Heresy. You know what I mean? Exactly right. But with this new edition, they've added just that extra thorn in the side of you've got advanced reactions for every legion. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so now I've not only got to understand that these reactions are going to be pulled out annoyingly when I don't want them to be, but you're also going to have legion ones I've got to keep on top of. Oh, and not only that, but the legions have their own warlord traits and they're wildly imbalanced from one another. And it's like the more special rules you write trying to look for ways of making things different from one another for the sake of saying you made them different the more chance that you're going to make a mistake yeah. you're going to write one badly or and, and you know you're going to do something that like messes game balance or whatever it might be and lo and behold that's exactly what occurs mm -hmm. and this is why i was so pessimistic prior to um the release of heresy 2.0 because i'm like look i'm looking at this situation ahead of time and these are all the problems i predict are going to come to pass and you know what i'd say majority of them i made the right call you know for better or worse that uh, you can call it cynicism i just think it's it's practicality like i've been around long enough to understand when something is going to cause issues i think like you know yeah I'm, you I'm, don't you don't need to to play everything right you don't you can once you've played any warhammer game for a reasonable duration of time I think you'll be the first to agree with this, but feel free to disagree. You can generally look at things on paper and decide for yourself without even touching a dice pretty much how it's going to play out. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, so I, how come the writers can't? I, again, I, I think we're, we're going down We're going down the uh, the rabbit hole because I, I we, 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 we will never know that question because unless we're in the studio, we're never going to... We can look at it from a very um, top-down, common-sense point of view and say how... How would me playing this game for five seconds without even knowing the rule set? How have I pulled out this nonsense where you've had the game in your studio for upwards of two years in the can, and you've not been able to? It obviously hasn't been play tested at all. Like it's just it's so obvious, it's beyond ridiculous. Um, one thing I would say is that there's a thing that I, another YouTuber, I forget his name, but he I think it might have been Voland or somebody I can't remember. But he did something called, called the, the Total War analogy for how he how he looks at Warhammer, and he said um, the, the game as it should be should be like a, a Shogun Total War, Shogun Two, where very much like Horus Heresy, where you have uh, different armies and and uh, the, the slight differences, very slight differences to the same core game system make them play extremely differently. So if you're on uh, you know, Shogun 2, the Shimazu will play differently to the Ikawiki, and the Ikawiki will play dif differently to the Date, and so on and so forth. But they're all samurai, and they all look very similar, but they have different strengths and weaknesses, different characters, different special rules for certain units, and, and, and away you go. Um, the problem is, is when you get into things like uh, Warhammer Total War, where there is just an insane amount of bloat, and special rules, and counter, and counter, and counter, and counter. And it's not a, a game of rock, paper, scissors anymore. 
a healthy game to me is based on rock, paper, scissors. It's literally this beats this normally, this beats that, this beats that normally. And that's what you do. And you build on the game from there. Warhammer Total War is a mess. Because you don't know what you're getting. You, you, you literally, at, at any point, dice are all behind the scenes, I know that. But at any point, you know, the, the meta is so bloated. And the actual roster of units is so bloated and misshapen and full of really weirdly worded special rules. You know? Like like good ver good versus medium. It's like well, what what does that mean? What is good? Is that a horse or is that a, you know? I, I don't know. <laughs> it just it goes on like that. And that's where we are with forty k, and that's where the original Horus Heresy. That's what got me into it. The original Horus Heresy. When I started working at Games Workshop, we just uh, uh, burning a Prospero had just come out. So I jumped on that shit straight away because I thought this is exactly what I think Seventh Edition should be. Is this you know? And, it, and every army played very similarly. You knew what you... Everybody became a skilled gamer almost overnight because everybody kind of knew what 60 to 70% of the enemy army could do. Do you know what I mean? It was the same as yours. But there was mm -hmm. always that mm -hmm. flavor where you were like, hang on a minute. Why Angron's going fucking Super Saiyan over there and he's tearing through all of my... Do you know what I mean? And, and you just... It was such a cool game for that. They kept it simple. And everybody could master it. Well, everybody could learn it and be good at it, but the real masters of the game could take their legion rules and their special rules that are in their army, and which and there's only a few of them, and they could wring every single piece of horsepower out of those rules, and they obliterated you through sheer skill. That was one of the best things that Games Workshop have done for me, and that's not what 40k is right now. It's 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 a world away from that, um, mainly because they, we've got they all still the have one ability. system. They still have one system that sort of straddles the line of it was once fantastic, um, had its flaws, and has, in my opinion, gotten worse, but has been expanded in a good direction generally, and they've done a good job with it generally, and that is the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings game set with the um, sort of the three phase turns where it's like you move all of your guys, then they move all of their guys, you shoot all of your guys, they shoot all of their guys, and then you basically pick whoever's turn it is, picks the fights out. That's a really, really good system. And I think there was unnecessary bloat added in the picking of weapon types, because it used to be just a hand weapon or a two-hand weapon type thing. Then they added things like, you know, are you going to do a feint? Are you going to do a piercing strike? Um that added bloat to a system that was already kind of slow because they're individual models as opposed to units. And then the way that, you know, they've added more rules over time, well, this is a faction and this faction has a faction bonus and, you know, they can take this allied faction, but if they're a historical ally, then it gets to keep their bonus. And, you know, that it suffers from that same bloat, but nowhere near as much. And I think that Lord of the Rings is an incredibly... Uh, well-written system which has really stood up the test of time and is probably their best like large uh, large-scale system because most of their systems let's face it are skirmish games mm -hmm. um, you know your necromundas yeah your underworlds is a bloody board game you know <laughs> titanicus is a skirmish game it's a complicated skirmish game with many many things going on on very few units but it's a skirmish game it's not like 40k well, the whole point of 40k is I, I go to events now um, and there'll be heresy playing in one end of the hall and there'll be 40k in the other. I go look at the 40k armies. They're unrecognisable as armies to me. They're just a mishmash of shit thrown onto the table by power gamers by because a company can't write rules to save themselves. And I just look at it going, what the fuck is this? Half the time it looks like they're playing Gundam Wing because it's just giant robots and yeah. monsters everywhere, you know? Yeah. And... And the other half of the time, it's like one really good unit that just gets spammed. And it's like, well, I guess it's just this thing. And and, and to be honest, something we don't really talk about enough is the laziness of the company in forcing out a release like a Corn Berserkers, you know, five minutes before an edition ends, where you can tell that they deliberately gimped the range and left miniatures out of it so they could sell them to you in the next edition with a Codex update. Yeah. And you then end up with like four or five units to represent an entire serious faction. It, it's just it's just laughable to me, you know. It's, and this is why, you know, I can't say I get upset 
I, I've lost the strong emotional reaction to it. I get exasperated in the people involved, but I'm indifferent to it now. Like, it doesn't make me sad. It doesn't make me angry. I just think of how great it could be because I think of all my childhood, teenage, and even adult memories, the, the so much fun I had over the years playing these systems. You know, friends I've made, um, you know, that means so much to me. I want others to experience those opportunities. And they may not get the chance to because of corporate incompetence. And I just find it really sad. That's a really good way to, to leave off the, the, the hobby side of that other video. That's a really good final statement. So thank you for that. But, uh, you know, I absolutely couldn't have said it any better myself. Um, bit of a sidestep, though. And this this might get your hackles up. I don't know, but you do teach. You know, it's, it's part of your part of your life now. Is it, that you? Is that like you teach as well? Which I, I really love. I think it's great. Um, everybody should teach. Every everybody's got a skill out there that they can teach, no matter what it is. But in the UK, uh, we've seen the rise of teachers and history classes bespoke, uh, blatantly changing history to suit the modern political climate. I'm not going to say which way it is or, or, or what they're doing, but here we are. Is the same thing going on in Australia? And what do you think of the phenomenon as a whole of changing history in a classroom to, to or, or, or make it more palatable to young minds? Would you reckon there should be a, a hard line there of, of, of don't fuck around? Or do you think maybe certain things can be changed and maybe certain you know uh, things can be warped to suit the agendas going on right now? This is a very dangerous topic. <laughs> because what's yeah, happening man. what's happening around the world okay there may be uh cases where people want to you know take the achievements of other races for example mm -hmm. call them their own yep that's the thing that's, that's happening yeah what i think is what i think is is beneficial to a degree is taking what's known about history and expanding on the parts that we don't talk about you know the the underbelly yeah so for australia it might be something like the colonialism and aboriginals mm -hmm. and what the effects of it are okay let's expand upon that but there's a cutoff point there where you go from expanding on it to we're just going to focus on the topic and guilt trip you mm -hmm. and there needs to be proportionality learn the lessons from it learn why did this occur in the first place what did both sides do? Because there's always two to tango in any conflict. I know it's going to upset people, but it's true. There are actions and consequences. And, you know, what might seem like, oh, no, these people were, you know, peaceful people who were attacked by a conqueror. That's very rarely the case yeah. in all of human history. You know, um, everywhere throughout the world has been carnage, violence, and horrible acts committed. And we're living in the most peaceful time in human history. Yeah, there's a conflict going on in Ukraine, there's tensions in East Asia, but really, you don't know how blessed you are. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, for me personally, I'm, a, I'm very big into, um, very, very passionate about history, um, but especially the First World War, and it comes up a lot in our conversations because there are so many lessons in that war that were learned uh, the hard way, you know, 18 million lives. Yeah. And we took some on board, others we forgot, and you know you're doomed to repeat right but what we don't tell people about we're happy to commemorate these wars you know you'll have you know uh november the 11th for example armistice day type thing and we'll commemorate these wars we talk about you know those who sacrifice for our country but you we don't sit there and show the graphic violence to our children um you know and there is obviously a point in age where that is appropriate um, where you don't have to show them everything. But if people don't have an understanding of what has happened, mm. then they're willing to let the government get away with some pretty bad things. Because I think governments... I'm, I'm a classic libertarian, right? Not a liberal, a libertarian. I believe in small government and, you know, personal yeah, responsibility. Leave us alone, sort of thing. Yes. And, you know, do you think people would be supporting war? If, if they understood what the actual 
you know, those of us who were soldiers understand it a lot better than those who aren't. But those who aren't can appreciate it when they start to see some of the consequences of it. No one in the world would be trying to get involved in what's going on between Ukraine and Russia right now if they understood just yes. how horrible it is. But instead, like, you know, we hide it away. Oh, that's censored. You can't show this graphic trench fighting in a Ukrainian trench. Well, here, you know, here's, so, the, here's, the, it, here's the thing, like, like a, fl a flip on that. Is, is what you said um you know recently when, when i went to the us i, I uh, converted to, to, to uh, judaism now i'm not a practicing jew so please don't come at me with uh, in the comments with israel comments because you know um but i was getting married to a jewish lady and i needed to convert so i did and um since then it, the labor party of course in the uk have had a lot of problems with anti-semitism things like that but a lot of it comes from the younger people who are going into the party. And on your point there, I think it's, it's so prevalent to what's going on, in that we were never... I was shown, when I was a kid, things about the Holocaust, right? I'm sure you were as well in school, right? You, you were shown, like, um, sometimes figures, um, even photographs of what was going on, and what was found in, the, in these concentration camps, things like that. And it really made you think, oh, that, that shit's never happening on my watch. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what they put you back up a little bit. You know, no, 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 no fuckers doing that to people around me. You know, um, but I've noticed in schools where I'm teaching, and even way before this, like in the last 10, 15 years, that's gone. You know, the, 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 as you just said, they're afraid to show this to, to kids, and all of a sudden you've got this weird rise of, you know, they're not exposed to it, so they think it's, they don't think it's a good idea, but they're not afraid of it. You know, they, 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 it doesn't hold a taboo for them. They, they, they don't see human suffering as something that's happening to them. It's, you know, and then you get the, the radical people saying, well, well, my, well, maybe it didn't happen. Or maybe maybe it's not such a bad thing that it does happen. You know, and, and you get all these weird thought processes coming in because they're not exposed to just how horrific it can be. And I, that, you know, we like Warhammer. That's well. definitely a, a huge part of it. Um, but there's one thing that, you know, I, I look back on my youth yeah. and my decision-making process and the way that our, my, my brain evolved and obviously how everyone else does. And I've come to a conclusion pretty recently. Um, I think most people have come to this conclusion as well, who are, you know, mid thirties like myself. And that conclusion is that the youth tend to mean well but they cannot examine cause, effect, and repercussions. They can only get as far as, you know, like a Greta Thunberg, like a, well, I think climate change is an issue. Okay, what's your solutions, Greta? Oh, I don't have any. Well, great. Yeah. We, we need more than that. We need a stance from and the point, yeah. Yeah, people go, you know, everyone should be paid a fair wage. Every, every, no one should have to work or whatever it might be. It's okay. Well, how are you going to get your stuff? Well, well people would still make it. It's like, would they? Why would they want to work when you don't want to work? Mm. What, you know, like <laughs> the ability to understand the second, third, fourth chain of events of repercussions to an action, I think is what defines the difference between a young adult and an adult. Mm-hmm. And, you know, immigration is, is one of those things where, you know, I won't state whether I'm pro or anti-immigration. I'm, I'm generally pro-immigration, but mm -hmm. um, you want someone to immigrate to your country from another country. First question, are they skilled? Yes or no? Uh, if yes, okay. Are they skilled for that country or are they skilled for your country? Because educations are different from place to place around the world. And a doctor who got their education in a third world country might not be anywhere near competent or qualified enough to be a doctor in your country. Mm -hmm. So there might have to be some educational assessment there, some retraining there. You go, okay, well, they're, they're skilled. We want more doctors in the country. Let's bring them over anyway. Well, until such time as they're able to work, how are you going to support them? You're going to need to clothe them, to feed them, to house them. And then you've got things like gas, electricity, all these ancillaries, let alone if they bring over a family, you know, you're going to pay for the family as well, subsidize them. Uh, they need to learn the language skills, the laws, the customs, how to travel and all of that around the country. And all of these things take time. And we just assume that, okay, there'll be a net benefit though, that we're adding another taxpayer eventually to the taxpaying 
uh, population and we're adding someone who's got skills that are desperately needed in the community. And we try and weigh these against each other and say, well, this is going to be a net positive. And yet we won't do these same things for our own citizens. Yeah. And do we not think that's going to cause resentment? So, you know, and it's it's a very complex issue. And unfortunately, society, through this whole not examining the third and fourth, re, you know, effects of this, the repercussions, um, has caused great, great problems because, you know, we're basically telling people to, to make their decisions based on entirely on empathy and not rationality. It's um, well-meaning, but you know nonsensical at times it, it, it is what like, i i will say like a lot of the kids that i teach not one of them is a bad person like you know at the core not one of them sitting there saying oh well we should get rid of all the jews or we should do this or we should do that uh, but what i would say is that a lot of their opinions are formed on um a uh, from living in a bubble you know from living in this in this wonderful world that, we, that we've created for them where, where we have this they don't need to look at war. They don't need to look at pestilence or, or, or famine. You know, um, um, there, there, there was that glorious thing that I, I really, I really like. You know, what, what was it called? It was, it was um, hard men create soft times. You know, that, that that dynamic of, you know, our parents and our our grandparents created this world that's amazing, and now we 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 added to it and we're going on again. But unfortunately, you know, uh, what I'm seeing in schools is that a lot of these kids don't really know. Or aren't really aware of the repercussions of of some. Um, I'm just going to say it: the amount of socialists we have in schools now is alarming. <laughs> it's it's really and the amount of like 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 over the over the wall communists that we have in schools who who unironically wear Che Guevara t-shirts to you know a non-uniform day in school and things like that. It's just uh, do you know what that means? Do you know where? I'm sorry, like. Do you know how many people that's killed over the years? And it 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 becomes a slogan, and, and it's like we're, we're approaching this cycle again of not learning our our from our, our mistakes. And if you want to know how much we don't learn from our mistakes from history, I mean, democracy's still around. <laughs> it was around in in Greece. I mean, it wasn't exactly. I mean, they wouldn't recognize our democracy. They'd be like, "What the hell is that? That's not their own democracy." But still, we call it democracy. You know. Um, so yeah, I get what you're saying. It, it, it is one of those things, but we'll leave that there because I, I think that's, that's a good way to, to leave that. It's a good one. I've got a more light-hearted question for you now. What is your game of the year, and what is your open weight game of the year? Open weight means it can be from any year, but you played it for the first time this year. You're like, oh, that that was cool. You know, what, what do you reckon? I've saw you play tabletop video games. Video games. Let's go with video games. Game of the year this year. I don't think there's been any game of the year this year that mm -hmm. I, I look at and I feel so strongly um, about that I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's that's one that I'm just so glad I've got. Mm. You know, mm. Mm. No, I'm kind of the def same. Definitely nothing that falls into that. I'm um, kind of the same. Games are just so predatory these days. Um, that was the next question, actually. I, yeah. I I loved like like you know all time heavyweights of games. I could narrow it down to something like maybe like Diablo two, Age of Empires two, um, those sort of games. Um, I'm I'm more of a strategy person, but they're games that I just have infinite love for. That's like I can go back infinite replayability. Mm -hmm. Um. And I don't feel like nickel and dimed. There is so much um, that I can do in those games where it's like that endless replayability. And I didn't need DLC for it. And another thing is they functioned the day I got them. There wasn't a, a 60 gigabytes patch. And <laughs> yeah. There are fun games. And, and people seem to act like you can't have a decent modern game unless it is, you know, 128 gigabytes in size and, you know, worked on for eight years and has a $40 billion budget. You know, made by a AAA gaming company. There's a little game called Nebuchadnezzar that I got, um, which is like a Sim City type city builder, very similar looking to like an Age of Empires 2, um, set in Babylon. And it's not about combat and war or anything like that. It was just 
you're in Babylon, make a functioning city and learn how to trade, you know, like wheat and barley to people around you. Perfectly fun game. Or a, um, um, oh, geez, it will come to mind. Uh, it was a space game a few years ago. Um, now let me look. I've got um, all this of all games I've had installed Stellaris, right next to me. No, although I do have Stellaris. Um, oh, it's going to annoy me now unless I figure out what it was. None of those, none of those. FTL. Oh, FTL. Faster than okay. Yeah, cool. That yeah, was FTL game, was yeah. a really fun game. That was really yeah. cool. Um, little simple, you know, no like crazy monetization. Um, I really like Killing 4 and Killing 4 2. Um, Killing 4 2 especially because in the environment that that game was released into, here's a game that's like, yes, there is DLC, but all the maps are there. You can just play them. Mm. And... If anyone else that's playing the round with you has DLC, you just get to use the DLC. That's cool. I like that. That's cool. You know, it's not like a Call of Duty where it's like, well, that guy forked out and got, you know, this weapons crate, and now he has a slightly better version of the M14 rifle. No. In this game, it's like, yeah, the minigun is a DLC item, but you're in a game with someone who has it unlocked. Now you can buy the minigun in the game mm. with the in-game, in you know, currency that you earn in that round fantastic like they're so user friendly and it allows you to respec your class anytime you want you don't have to pay any weird made up currency like gems to respec your skills you know when it's like five dollars to get more gems and oh but you know five dollars only gets you enough gems to respec it once but if you pay eight dollars you can respec it twice that's what we got with, with, <laughs> with dark tide isn't it like it's another one of those games that comes out and you're just like oh, oh. <laughs> we know it's a games workshop you know affiliated game can you not act like them please can you just like give us a, give us a, a product that works out a, the box you know just you know. i played a lot of vermin tide and dark tide and mm. my my issues with those games are that it's like you have a great core concept here but there's only so many times i can play the same map yeah, yeah. and if you're only doing five maps and and they feel very they're not but they feel very procedurally generated they feel like you could have just made a random number generator to think up the maps for you and tell it, oh, I want a random number of encounters. These are the amount of enemies I expect to be scattered throughout the level and go. And the game just generates the map on the fly. That's what it feels like, you know. Um, we're in a world where early access games have become so prevalent that they like they drop as an early access you start the game up there are a busted mess and they call it early access i expect early access to be like a couple of months at most yeah before a release and they don't they'll stay in early access like a pub g well, for a year well i, I think it's and, less it's less on like the game itself i honestly think if you're a company of a certain size it should be illegal for you to be to have an early access game ea if you're, if you're affiliated with EA, you should not be allowed to enter into early access. It should be a thing that's made for independent developers to get the money to finish the game. That's it. That's what it's there for. That's what it was always there for. But again, AAA gaming, and they get the, the little grubby little mitts into it, and now we're getting unfinished games that are patched years later. Um, and people point towards, If they ever patch know, them. If they ever patch them. I think uh, people pointed towards Cyberpunk as an example. That's not a good example because that was literally um, a company making a huge mistake in releasing that game early and taking on too much. They, they, they jumped to... They went for the, the sun, right? They went for it and they did. He fell really short. That game's amazing now, by the way, but that doesn't... It sort of proves a point, doesn't it? Well, that was yeah. like a No Man's Sky. Yes. Know? And yeah. But both those, both those situations, though... It's the publishers yeah. that are the problem. Yeah. Because the publishers are saying, we want to return on the investment. Just release the game. And the companies often are like, look, if we release this now, like, you know, this is a bit yeah. of a mess. Yeah. And and the developers, no, no, no. We just want to fucking, you know, like a games workshop, we just we just need that release. Give us Sigma 3.0. Give us Sigma 4.0. You know, just, yeah. it's going to release. I think, I think, and with, with... yes, there is something to be said for deadlines. And you've invested money, you want to return on that investment, but yeah, 
you, do you want to release a good product that guarantees a return on investment or you just want to drop it because you're sick of investing in it? Or if you think they're incapable of completing the game in a reasonable time frame, then pull the pin. Well, we've had that with uh, Vampire the Masquerade, haven't we, too? Which is just heartbreaking considering how good that game, the first game was. But they, they, they fired the original writer as well because he was a bit too edgy for them and he, and he wore black gloves to the office, so um, they got rid of him. <laughs> and uh, mm. hopefully the new game isn't as, as as woke as it looks like it's going to be, but oh my days. Like The first vampire they showed us had like blue hair, or like she was in fucking Saints Row or something. I was, I was like, okay, right, right, yeah, I'm done. Or they, they, I don't know how much you know about Vampire the Masquerade, but they showed like a Bruja vampire, which is this boxing vampire, essentially. This amazing, you know, close combat. And like they're sneaking around doing shit. And I'm like, yeah, that's not what a Bruja does. And that's like showing a space marine who just like is wearing a miniskirt and serving at a bar. It's like, yeah, that's not what they do. You know, they're just, you know. Um, <laughs> but I will say, um, it, in certain ways, um, my game of the year is probably going to go to like Phantom Liberty, which is the, the cyberpunk um expansion like it was just you could tell they went this is what the game is supposed to be then this is what we wanted to make so here you go you know this is what we wanted to do and it was phenomenal and i loved every single minute of it so uh yeah i'm probably gonna get but it's not a, a game on its own one rec i've got a few recommendations for you though from what you were you were talking about before about strategy and uh, other things there's a game called road mm -hmm. warden and essentially it's a text-based adventure right and it's very low low tech low res and done by one guy who's a really good writer and you are essentially a guy in this fantasy setting who keeps the roads clear you're basically like a marshal who rides around doing stuff in the world and everywhere you go is really well written there's really good characters everywhere it's essentially a triple a rpg boiled down into a a um a text-based adventure i want amazing really cool steam review was you know uh Good parts of the game, it's amazing. It felt like I was playing a AAA game in my head. You know, it's awesome. Bad parts of it, Steam has finally managed to finesse me into reading a book, which I thought was like the best, the best review you can do of that game. And the other one is actually a mod for Rome Total War Remastered. It's called Roma Serectum, and it is the the biggest map in Total War history. It, it's it's like double the size of Warhammer. It's it's huge goes from um, uh, the UK all the way over to the Indus and way beyond the Indus River in, 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 and into India as well. Uh, height of the Roman Empire, well, the, the, the rise of the Roman Empire and all that sort of stuff. Uh, complete faction reworks, complete diplomacy reworks. Uh, they have even um, situational recruitment. So if you own Sparta for 10 years in-game, you, you can recruit Spartans and their armor looks different because now they're Roman Spartans. So they look kind of like a mix between the two and you get that across the map so you can go and get hoplites or, or um you know cataphracts and all these other things and, com and combine your armies by recruiting from different parts of your empire which i thought was amazing um the diplomacy as well there's one really cool thing that they do where they took the actual map of the eventual roman empire and if you're a faction in there you're going to face the romans at some point so you can ally with them, and they will actually send armies to come and help you out. Unlike the normal Total War. Being allied with people actually means something. Um, but if you're away from Rome, say if you're outside of Rome, and you're outside of the, of, the eventual, of the eventual borders of the Empire, you can actually ally with them, and they will fight your wars for you. <laughs> Which is, I think, is amazing. They send like one legion every now and again up to, up to help you out. It's amazing. And it's a, it's a graphical improvements as well. I, if you like strategy, mate, you like history get on it it's free download it it's in one file from the workshop you'll love it absolutely love it oh, that's interesting taking a taking under advisement yeah um so we didn't get a game of the year but we'll, we'll go with I, I know you've been playing company of heroes so we could just give it to that if you want even though you've played it loads um <laughs> so we, we play it because we're able to play it among a bunch of friends it is a pretty enjoyable game um um so what yeah. hobby plans what hobby plans do you have and what have you got done this year that's a big one what have you actually gotten done this year if you want got picks send them over i can put them on the screen i have been i have a goal which is to get 3d printing to be more mainstream in the hobby mm. um because people are very daunted by it and so i this year made a real goal to start producing my own 
hits and STLs and um, often giving away for free, but also paid because I need to pay for the software. Yeah. Um, so that people have, you know, filling in these uh, items that we don't have access to. Like, oh, there's a tank that has rules, but there is no model. Here you go, made a model. And doing that sort of thing, right? And trying to have these units, especially for like militia type armies. And then on top of that, terrain. Because I think terrain is one of the biggest limiting factors for people going that, that next step in hobby. Most people, given enough time, will build and paint an army. But tables are tedious. Building and painting, and the, and the cost is prohibitive. Mm. So I'm like, okay, I can make it so it's like you buy a $400 printer, you buy $100 of filaments, and you can build the table of your dreams. And it'll all be pre-assembled or like three or four parts maximum to most buildings that you can glue together. And... There you go. You'll have an awesome table that you and your friends can game on. And if you don't want to buy a printer, well, you can just get the files. Many are free. Some you got to pay for. And there are plenty of people who freelance it. You just say, hey, can you build me this? They'll say, no worries. They're everywhere out there. Um, and by doing this, and my, I myself am making a lot of tables. And I'm able to uh, create these tables and then sell them in my local community for cost. What it costs to make the table and now, by doing this, I've got an extra six, seven, eight tables in the last two years into the local ecosystem. Uh, now, that means that there are more people who can host events because there's more tables. And they're good tables. They're sturdy. They're solid because they're these large 3D printed structures. So if I see someone who's making really good 3D printed stuff, I'm like, I'll, I'll shield them, basically, for better, lack of a better term, if it's good. You know, um, and that's been a, a huge goal of mine this year is I want to try and help my community to make it easier for all of us. Because that's that's what it is the end of the day. It's easier for all of us. And um, I'm also building a bunch of armies on the side. I use a mixture of 3D printed parts. And in fact, I did a fully 3D, print, 3D printed um, heresy army that people do not realize is 3D printed. The few that have seen it. <laughs> that's cool. Um, it looks straight off the shelf from Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. And it was just to say, hey, I can do this and I don't think you'll pick it if you if I select the correct models, which, yeah, that's exactly the scenario. <laughs> um, Weirdly, so I, I think that. probably my army, which is officially Games Workshop, looks less Games Workshop than yours probably does. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got more mole guns. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I've got, to, I've got to spend six hours on each fucking model thing mole lines are. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so I, I did that, but I, but I've been making um, armies for host of factions because I do a lot of reviews of like the rules on my channel, and you know, like I say, ninety percent of situations I can just look at the rules and go, "Yep, that's how it functions." But I like to play it out because some people will argue with you until the heat death of the universe that your opinion doesn't matter until you've actually played it out. Mm. In which case, I would argue the people who wrote the game didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I take a great pride in trying to give the most factual information I can um, and trying to eliminate my biases, um, which is hard. It's hard as a reviewer to you eliminate think, your biases. As somebody who is, who is a, a big part of 3D printing and somebody whose whole, whole career like revolves around, you know, the, the process of, of manufacturing things and, and all, all that sort of stuff... Um, where do you see 3D printing in like 10 years? Or do you reckon we're on we're on the path to cutting out Games Workshop as a middleman and saying, look, we don't need you for Warhammer anymore? Or do you think we're, we're years away from that and you know, maybe it's a pipe dream to ever think we're going to get to that stage where we can say, listen, uh, £35 for a, for a box of 10 Space Marines is too much and I don't have to pay it anymore. Right now, Games Workshop is... If I was them, I'd be trying to make as many people as happy as I could with my product, and especially by writing uh, really compelling stories and campaigns and rules. Mm. Because that 3D printing revolution is coming fast. Just five years ago, look how few people were talking about 3D printed models. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, especially tabletop models. Like people saying, oh, well, it's not there yet, but one day it will be. We hit it's there three years ago. Mm. In 2020 and 2019, I was looking at 3D prints in like the original Anycubic Photon resin printer. They looked like the Titanicus models out of the box, like just straight out of the printer. This looks like a perfect Titanicus model. I mean, Geese Workshop themselves 3D print their masters. Mm. But they've got their head up their ass and won't, you know, try and improve the way they deal with their customers. Instead, they're just like, it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, the head in the sand approach. Um, no, I think what's going to kill them is 3D printing mm. uh, as opposed to their bad consumer practices. Because what's going to happen is 3D printing will reach a point rapidly. Probably, I'm going to I'm going to say the 2040s. Okay. 3D printing will have reached the point um, within the next 20 years, probably 2040-ish, um, where they are so user-friendly and so freely available that if you have something you want to print, it's not a case of handling toxic resins and fumes and all of that. It'll be, here's a cartridge of raw material, plug it in the side. It prints the miniature, it cleans the miniature in there, and it spits it out like a vending machine at the bottom. That's where I think it will end up as a technology. Is that where you and think it might even be a case that velocity is for them? For them just saying, "Hey, we don't need you anymore." That is in twenty forty. Yes. Or okay. Yep. Because because right now there's games. Games Workshop is not an evil company. I, I can't stress this enough to people. Why there are so many great things about them. Of They're course, just yeah. badly managed. Yeah. You know what a corporate nepotism in there where people who do nothing have climbed their way to the top and they've been there so long there's no they you know the, these are ticks who have dug so deep into the flesh you're never going to remove them mm. um you know and as long as those people are there the company is doomed but if they turn it around and they're like you know what we've done a deal with us with a partner um like you know we're gonna let's pick any cubic right any cubic we really like their their consumer 3d printers we're going to supply games workshop files to them can you imagine? Uh, on our website can you imagine you'll be able to <laughs> yep and break and the go, world Look, it's not it's it's not that important to us that you buy our plastic off the shelf yeah what is important to us is that you're playing our game discussing our universe playing the linked video games to our universe that all generate us money buying our hobby supplies our paints our paint brushes you know um all of that they'll make plenty of money on but they just, they refuse to. Yeah. For whatever reason. Um, and I think it's, they don't want to, they, they want to pretend that, you know, they don't want to let that cat out of the bag. They they don't want to say like, yep, 3D printing is as good. You know, I mean, like I said, they, they prototype all their models in 3D printing. You can see the 3D print lines on them. I mean, they could even um, be cheeky and, many and of, say, if you want like to do them yourself, it won't be as good as ours, but for a subsidized price, you can do them at home. You know, they could... Do it like that, where they could market it that way if they wanted to. But I don't know if any company Steam, would get to better Steam than that. and uh, Steam and Gabe Newell. You know, he's like Look, the the problem with piracy is it's you know that the difference between like the market um, and the companies, and the market wants convenience and low cost. Yeah. So provide them with that convenience and that low cost, and like, people say, oh well, you know, if Games Workshop had um. Uh, gave out STLs, they would get pirated. Not if they were cheap enough. Yeah, people would rather not They're risk yeah. having corrupted files or downloading a virus if it's really cheap to buy an STL off Games Workshop. Why would they go to someone else? Yeah. Yes, there'll be a small community who will, but they're so small in proportion to the size of the company. I would argue that they're losing more money to the recast market right now than they ever would to three D printing. How how what, if they what took the right approach? Would you say would be fair? For, for like a, a Space Marine STL, what, what would you say would be the fair price point right now? Well, if, I, if I gave you the keys and said, look, Mark, we're doing this. We're going to work. We're doing this. Right. Give me a price point. What are we doing? Uh, uh, Prime Morris Intercessor, our main unit. How much are we charging right. for it? If, if, it's, if it contains the equivalent of all of the bits you get in the current box now, mm -hmm. 30 bucks. 30 bucks and you have it forever. Yeah, you okay. can you can do as much as you want with that STL for the rest of your life. Because then you kind of do right, like the video game market, aren't you? You kind of like, well, you've got it forever. It's your piece mm -hmm. of software now. Yep. And and you can download it onto your computer. Done, dusted. Everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. 
that is that is the potential mm -hmm. um because like i say once it becomes plug and play where there is no thought to the setup why would anyone not just rip, like 3d print their miniatures and it just comes out perfect all the parts are glued on there's no mold lines mm. you know it, it's just ready to go there's none of that assembly there no, just clean right. it, there's clean still it be a market for away you go paint it yeah there's still be a market for miniatures that require assembly there's still be a market for conversions those sort of things you know but that's where other processes like you know etched brass and your military scale modelers all come in but if these are, are people who just want to play basic games of 40k in their local group who cares if they they 3d print their parts no and, and you know it'd be a great way to also slowly transition away from injection molded plastics to you know start doing little things like all the chapter shoulder pads find someone who's really good at it give them the legal license for it they're now responsible for looking after it and making sure that other people don't undercut the market so games workshop doesn't have to be the one who goes around and chases up the you know sending out the dmcas yeah no, they can, the person they can who the gave the license to can yeah I mean. yeah and they're responsible for it and they can say like this is our trusted partner and they can produce as many shoulder pads as they like for the game system and uh then you the customer have access to all these upgrade kits now to make your custom chapters using any of these parts that this person supplies and we as a company no longer have to make dies and the expense and have this extra sku on our price codes mm. uh for for these parts i think one thing i wanted to say um in, in regards to, to what we're talking about here and i think we, we both get a little bit of flack for being like games workshop haters I think that happens a lot. Where I, I get that a lot, where it's like, oh, well, you had a bad experience working for them, so you're predisposed to not like them. No, I, I, I love... There are far more good people working for Games Workshop than bad. You know, there are far more... It, it's it's just a few cock... Uh, a few cocks? <laughs> I don't know where my mind went there. A few cooks spoil the broth, you know what I mean? Um, well, cocks would also spoil it, to be fair, but, you know, whatever. Um, and that I think that's where we are, is, is that it's not... We're not sitting here hating on a company just just be, just because it does clicks um unfortunately negativity does sell but i think as long as you're making a distinction between you know getting clicks and actually giving an honest opinion i think you should, people should be given the benefit of the doubt now the second part to this is that i don't think either of us are saying that uh, games workshop needs to not make money or games workshop needs to be a charity or games workshop needs to to, to uh, essentially not be profitable. No, we, we would love Games Workshop to be drawn. Again, stop me from talking for you and you don't agree. Uh, but we'd both love to, to see Games Workshop be profitable and do well because then the wider Warhammer hobby is doing well. The problem is, is that the world's changed. And Games Workshop are still running themselves like this was the mid-90s. And they have been very, very, very slow to, again embrace the market as, it, as it's happening i think they're still reeling from the fact that they had to get rid of the mail order business quite frankly you know i think that's where they still are like they're like well we, we got rid of the mail order for you why can't you be happy well because we don't need to be anymore we, we've got a, a really cheap alternative that essentially is as good as what you do it's just that it's not as accessible which is again what you're trying to do is make it more accessible it's not as accessible as it could be as soon as it is your company's finished. If if you keep going down this avenue, your company's finished. If there's if there's no plan in place to to roll with the punch that three D printing's bringing, I was shocked. Like when I first started this channel, I was one of the people who thought, well, three D printing it's years away. You know, until we're we're at the point where they can replace Games Workshop products. People have opened my eyes to this. You know, by, by sending me models. Some people have literally sent me models. I said, here's a, new, here's a space marine I painted. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's not real. It's not a real space. It, that's 3D printed. And I didn't know. Like, I'm just sitting here going, that is incredible. You know, what, what, what is uh, what people are able to do these days on, very li on a limited budget, on like 300, 400 pounds. And you've got yourself a really decent 3D printer. Um, so when those barriers to entry come down even further, I, I don't know. There's got to be conversations going on in Lenton, in Nottingham, where they're saying, "Oh shit, fuck," you know, <laughs> this is this is happening. This is and if, and if it isn't, I really fear for the for the future of that company. And I and I mean fear. I, w I will take no pleasure. And I don't. I don't. You would you either. Know, Mark, you know, you'll take no pleasure in, in the downfall of Games Workshop whatsoever. You know, it's not. 
you know, tons of people work there. What, what I find interesting is the fact that they're still trying to expand their production facilities mm. and still buying equipment. That suggests to me that they don't take the threat seriously enough because mm. I'd be looking at putting a hold on that and just seeing, you know, what direction the wind is blowing in and going, you know, we're putting an awful lot of capital investment into injection molding. Mm. What if injection molding goes away? Yeah. Like, they're going to have to sell on those machines to someone. Like, and, and we're not talking an investment here of, you know, a few hundred grand. We're talking hundreds of millions. Millions, millions, yeah. Between, you know, millions in, you know, every time they buy a few machines. But if they have to upgrade, like, the power supply going into a factory, all right, and all of the problems that go into that, building a new factory, the electricity, because injection molders use a lot of electricity. Um, we had a full acre of solar cells mm. and they supplied about 15% of the power required for 14 Jesus. injection molders. Jesus. Like the amount of power required. And this is with Australian sunlight, which is, mm -hmm. you know, we're on the sun. Yeah, so yeah. it's a lot brighter. Um, yeah, I don't think they take it seriously, but to, to go back to your point about like, you know, negativity. So I don't think negativity sells anywhere near as well as positivity because how many channels, do you know that, you know, basically rag on Games Workshop, as it were, that are huge? That's true. That's true. Then they're not. That's you know, true. it's your biggest channels out there. Uh, you know, milk toast uh, um, criticism at most, mm -hmm. and many of them are law channels as well, which are I would say very neutral arbitrators. Mm -hmm. But there's this strange protectionism of games workshop right there the sacred cow people will criticize religion politics car companies um the cars themselves movies the actors and actresses in said movies the political affiliation um they'll criticize one another's clothing they'll complain about the meal they had at the restaurant but don't you dare fucking criticize games workshop mm -hmm. now i would be on board with that sentiment if we didn't offer solutions but i go ahead of my way to make sure that everything i'm complaining about i'm like hey this is what i would do different yeah here is where you stuffed up and why and how to avoid it in future i'm trying to give them the feedback that it's they don't want and yeah and we saw this like you go talk to anyone if you know and i know quite a few people who play tested heresy too mm -hmm. they said i pointed out this and this and this and i'll go and talk to someone in the uk and they point out the same things i talk to people in america they pointed out the same things the community knew the bloody game pointed out the problems the company told them we don't care hmm. and it's like great that is why 3d printers are going to kick your ass yeah I, I, and again there is no uh, there is no pleasure in sharing that news i suspect it is more of a for god's sake you know we, we could literally have the most forward thinking the most epic epic hobby in the world i'm um, here, here's the point games workshop for me that they, they make money despite themselves not because despite themselves mm -hmm. like they they make constant decisions like this and i really hope that they 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 make a change that they, they see the changing weather of the of the industry they, they see this thing coming maybe they know something we don't but at the end of the day um I don't know what that thing is because the models that I'm seeing are at the same quality or better than what Games Workshop are producing right now. And I'll be honest with you, I can't. I can't see a future where this isn't going to kick them square in the bollocks. I can't. I. I, I literally can't. It, it. If your entire business model revolves around selling very overpriced models, um, and then. The, well, the, the, unless unless the people up the top just want to you know cash out that might that might be a thing i mean that that's something that people have hinted at for a long long time is that the people i mean rick Priestley, i know brought him up again but he said it before he, he knows personally the people at the top of games workshop the shareholders at games workshop is yeah the, the, the people who own the company that they're, they're not going to be around for much longer they're going to be around for another maybe five to ten years but the, but the families there's like five or six families who own games workshop they're going they're selling up like they're not going to be around for much longer, so maybe 
it'll be a, a matter of waiting until those people leave and the company is taken over by maybe a, 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 a vaster company than Games Workshop or maybe it'll be a, a consortium or whatever, I don't know. But maybe we need to wait until there's a sea change at the very top level where they, they, they take their head above the parapet and they sniff the air. They touch grass and go, oh shit, this is on its way. It's actually here already. Oh my god, um, we're losing money, you know. Um, hopefully we're going to get to that stage, but un unless we get a massive change right at the top of the company, I can't see. And by the way, if you are a person who one day, or you're listening to this video, who gets involved with Games Workshop on an ownership level, most of your middle management, get rid of them. Get rid of them. It's gone. Like, at least 50% of, of the people between the top brass and the guys on the ground floor, the guys on the battlefield, get rid. Because I, I swear to you, there is a a vast over proportion of people at that company who hold things up and don't want things to change who are part of the old guard that were there in the 90s you know and, and were there in, in the in the early noughties who want it to still be like it was back then and they and they don't like it when things come along because it's threatening to them right those are the people not the old guard to... who are creatives no bring Wait, those sorry, back no. you keep firing those people <laughs> like bring those back Go and go to Rick Priestley on hand and knee and say, "Come on, come and make us, come and make us another Space Hulk, please," or somebody like that. Andy Chambers again, a re really good rule. You know, get them to come back and do something at the company because at the, at the the rate they're going at the moment. And again, I say it time and time again. I don't think either of us are saying this with a. We're not sitting here like Mr. Burns rubbing our hands together with the downfall of Games Workshop. That's not what it's about. It's about the the, the actual hobby being better. And the hobby is better, I think you'll agree, with Games Workshop here. It's better with them here. And but I can see a, a future where they're really going to struggle. And, 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 and the, the crises of the early noughties where, where they were going down the pan and they were saved, quite frankly, by a few good business decisions, I think that might be, you know, shown as a bit of a false dawn negatively. It might be a bit of a, well, you thought that was bad. You know, now we don't need to buy your models. What do you? What does your business do when we don't need your models anymore? I've well, especially when there's no loyalty left. I mean, and and put it in perspective for people, what this is. If we disliked the company, disliked everything they did, we wouldn't bother making videos. No, there'd be no point to it. Um, we talk about it because we're passionate about it. And from my perspective, and again, feel free to butt in if I'm wrong here. It is in our best interest to have good content, to have the company putting out good products, because for us, the people making these videos, that gives us fuel to create videos. When they put out bad product, that's it. We just get to say, it's bad, here's why, goodbye. If they bring out something that's great, it's like here's a new game system, like if Legion Imperialis was a fantastic version of Epic, the best thing ever with awesome models at a fantastic price point, that's opened up a whole new avenue for my channel to explore. Oh, yeah. Let's do some battle reports. Let's get a set and build it together on the channel. You know, let's video it. Instead, that's not what I'm getting. What I'm getting is, hmm, this is really overpriced. And most of the people I'm talking to in my channel are saying it needs to be a third of the price, if not a quarter of the price. And a few saying half the price. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't bode well. And, and that's it. That's all I can really do about because I'm not interested in buying the box and mm -hmm. um, so their business decisions has worked out badly for me as a person who's creating content because now that's something I can't make content on unless I want to talk about the bad things which I don't particularly want to do so it's putting me in a in a worse light in a worse situation I don't want to be in because of their business decisions mm. so when we talk about it it's, it's coming from a good place. We want them to be better. Um, I, I guess you could call it from a selfish place, if anything. Yeah. Because if they're better, it's better for us. Mm -hmm. More models and, and better game systems and more balance. And, you know, they're, they're around for a long time and we can introduce others to it who hopefully will share the, sh the same um, joy that we've been able to take out of it. Um, I think the last issue is, that's... is that um, if, if you don't approve of Games Workshop and what they do, um, and you're not a YouTuber who's living relies on you having these models. Do you really need to spend 120 English pounds on Legion Imperialis? You know, is it something you really need to be doing right now? Because if you don't like that price point, 
don't buy the fucking models. Like, you can go without for a little while, right? Or, or get them from somewhere where you're going to get a huge discount. But do not give this company money if you completely disagree with the amount that they're charging for the models. The amount of people that I, I know who, who continue to give them money and I won't entertain them. I, I won't because they, they'll complain to me and say, well, the prices are ridiculous. You, you, you've lost your, your, your right to say that because you keep giving them money. You can't just sit in the fire and complain it's hot. You need to take, you need to, if you don't want, I said this to the guys, the Games Workshop that I worked at back in the day. Um, so, so they hated the manager, right? Everybody did. He was, he, was, he was a big old douche nozzle. Every now and again, he'd do something cool, but for the most part, it's kind of like Homelander. Do you know what I mean? Every now and again, he'd do something all right, but like, for God's sake, he's a psychopath. Um, so, they would complain constantly to me and the other, the other staff member about this guy. And they would moan and bitch and moan, but they would turn up every day. And I said, look, either you complain to head office about this guy, or you stop fucking moaning. I'm not listening to this for another nine-hour shift. I'm not doing it, you know? And eventually, they did go to Games Workshop, and he did get a reprimand, and again, his 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 behavior improved for a time. But you just, you lose. You, you can't sit there as, as I'm going to say the word whale. You can't sit there as a whale who gives Games Workshop this amount of money and complain that the fire is hot when you're standing in it and you refuse to move, you know? Um, models aren't the be-all and end-all in the world. You can find other things to do with, or even other game sets, or other game, or other 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 companies that would love to take your money. By the way, other companies that would love to have you as part of their their zeitgeist, you know, and would treat you really well, and would actually give you decent, decently looking models that you ignore because Space Marines look cool. Well, it's fine, they do, but I'm sorry, but you you lose the moral high ground if you give this company money when you disagree with the price points that they're coming up with. Oh, and what I want to add to that, if, if you're the other type of person that pops up who says, well, if you don't like it, don't buy it, and that's all you're, you've got to say because you're wow. happy with the system, like, I like things the way they are, I'm happy to pay that. Great. Our existence in creating these channels and talking about these issues does not affect you in the least. And if anything, it makes things better for you because if we get a better outcome, that's going to be better for you. Mm. So just stay out of the way because all you're doing is shooting yourself in the foot to defend a giant corporation that that will throw you aside yeah, yeah they like, don't give you defend a shit them about you defend them all yeah you defend yeah. them all who you like how many free miniatures are they seeing you yeah if the number is zero well congratulations you know um and if they have sent you free miniatures what did they let you do with them because well, yeah. one of the big problems we've got right now is we have false reviews where I get sent oh. things like 3D printers. I knock back a lot of printers, by the way. Mm. But I get sent these things, and I guarantee you, I come up with faults every time. Where I'm like, this could be better, this could be better, this is not good. You know, I've got one at the moment where it's almost perfect mm. for what I want in a filament printer. Um, and that review is dropping soon. But it's like, that's a review. Yeah. You talk about the things that are wrong with it. But when you go into a channel and they're like, oh, I got given this new Games Workshop box set. Thanks, Games Workshop. Hmm. Let's build it together. And it's like, you know, and they're not sitting there talking about, you know, wait, why is this weapon not included? Why is this not in here? Blah, blah, blah. You're getting a promotion. Mm -hmm. You're getting an advert. And an advert well, is meaningless. Well, well people are, are, are absolutely shameless in their thumbnails sometimes when it says, you know, I uh, or, or their, um, their title of the video is like, I got sent you know, five keepers of secrets from Games Workshop. How quickly can I, you know, for a challenge or or, or Games Workshop called my bluff? And no, they, no, they didn't. You asked them for something, and they gave it to you. They're not your. Fr Stop acting like this corporation's your friend. Stop. And, <laughs> and what did you sign in your agreement? Exactly. Yeah. What, what What does the NDA say? I've seen the NDA. Apparently, it's been changed slightly, and and but I've not seen the new one. But I've seen the old one, the one that was from last year. And it's completely restrictive. It, 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 you may as well not do anything with it because you're, you're literally a mouthpiece for the company. They get to they get to decide what is toxic speech in terms of a corporate in a, in a corporate way. And to them, obviously, and, and I would do it too. I'd be like, no, I'm not giving you free shit if you're going to talk shit about my company. Why would I do that? You know. But there's you know what? Wrong That's interesting that. because I would. Away. Would you? I I I oh yeah. I, you know. I, I 
when I was running production manager for a company mm. involving uh, plastics, I would happily show people the parts we made and say to them, like, hey, you want to try and break it? Break it. Go for it. Because I had faith yeah. in my product. Yeah. Yeah. I had conviction in my product. They don't, if, if they need to muzzle the people that they're wearing to review the product, what does that tell you? I think from me, it, it's more of a, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm taking it personally. Like, I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Like, I'm not saying like, um, I, I've got complete faith in my product, no problem. But like, it's more of the fact that, well, you want free shit and then to badmouth me? All right, you can, you can screw off that kind of a thing um yeah i know what you mean though i know exactly what you mean i think i'm just approaching it from the wrong area and being like how dare you um i guess some sort oh, of like how much more or something. How, how much more would it mean to the community if like you know instead of giving a horus heresy age of darkness box to someone who predominantly only ever makes lore videos or content for you know lord of the rings or for age of sigma or, or war cry or whatever give it to someone like me mm -hmm. Right, and you say like, look, you're not signed up to our program, but here, here's the box set. Make the review you want, and we'll wear it for better or worse. But we know that you're important in that group, mm -hmm. and people will take your opinion seriously. And Inform if I consumers. like it, yeah, yeah, if if I like the box set, that's going to go really well for them. Versus giving it to you know the Warcry guy, and he's like, mm -hmm. hey, people who watch my channel because you like Warcry. Here's this box that I randomly got sent. And they're gonna go, cool. I watch you for the war cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what tends to happen. So I yeah, get that yeah, all, all the time. I mean, I mean, it, it's it's getting to the point now where um, I'm gonna I'm gonna name one name that I, I think is okay. I think I think her name is uh, Sword and Steel. She's all right. Um, I I never used to like her channel because I thought, oh my god, you know, here we go. Games Workshop sent me this. But like she, it's just bland. That there's nothing. There's no like cheery stuff there. She just shows you what it is essentially, which you know. And I guess her channel is like she runs a hobby store too, so it's kind of like she's advertising what she's selling in a store. That I get. That's the only one who gets a pass. Everybody else, <laughs> who if at the minute you say Games Workshop sent me, I discount your opinion uh, utterly. I'm like, okay, your opinion now is null and void because i know what the nda I, I says think, i think that's you know. yeah I, I think that's probably a bit too extreme of you maybe there's, there's a lot of creators who do a lot within the bounds of what they can get away with and some of them you know for better for want of a better term savage the company in not so many words mm. it's just a lot less um obvious a lot more subtle than when i do it because you know it, it's it's an online persona we have right mm. that's slightly different to our our real oh, yeah. selves and in my case, uh, as an Australian, we swear for emphasis. It is not, you know, it is not um, frowned upon to swear in this country anywhere near what it is in other countries. Mm. Swearing is for emphasis. And instead, we have other slang terms that we use when we are really trying to insult a person. Mm. And so when someone hears me say, these fucking idiots, I'm not trying to be insulting there. I'm just saying, fucking in that sentence because mm. it's like emphasis. I'm emphasizing right. that I really think these people are idiots mm. that's it there's no further reading into it and people take it so seriously so when I do that that's like oh my god he's, he's so serious here but when someone you know who's been given a free copy is saying like yeah I don't really like the way they've um, laid out these things in this set that's pretty scathing yeah, I mean, because... I think the issue for me is I've never really seen somebody... If, if you've got any recommendations, then send them my way, but you don't need to do now if you don't want to. But um, I, I've never really seen a channel do that. I've never seen somebody get a free thing from Games Workshop and say, do you know what, this is this is pretty shitty. I don't like this. You know, or even if it's not that scathing, if they say, oh, I'm not quite sure about this mold line here, why is that there? Or I'm not quite sure about the, you know, the, the posing and the, the monopose. I don't like this. And it's, it's generally... I've only ever seen a, a, a sword and steel, you know, here is the product, or I've seen a, a complete shill saying this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, you know. Yeah, yeah, I just, false, false enthusiasm is, yeah. is the kiss of death. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I see what you mean. Like, I don't discount everybody. And I, as I say, I try and give everybody a chance, but I've not really seen anybody. I would love you to get free stuff because that would be great. Like, if you ever got free, and it's never going to happen because for obvious reasons, because we've we covered them multiple times. But um, if you ever got free stuff from Games Workshop where it was like, okay, Mark, go on. Like, you, you review this. 
on, let's see what you do with it. Then I'll be interested. Then I'll be like, okay, you know, or or, or a channel like yours where they where they've actively gone against the grain sometimes and said, look, this isn't this isn't good enough. Like you're the best model maker in the world. You, that that's your your mission statement is we want to make the best war gaming miniatures in the world, and we want to continue doing this forever. Well, if that's your mission, and that's literally the mission statement, by the way. It's in, in the black book. I've got it downstairs in my box. The black book of, of retail that you get at the start of your time at Games Workshop. I, I was going to do a video on it, then my lawyer told me not to. <laughs> but, like, that's literally your mission If that's your mission statement, then every box you do has to be the best version of that box. And, and again, if it's not, then that needs to be taken to task. Like, it needs to be pulled up. And, as you say, Mac, um, if you have complete faith in your product you would give your product to you know channels like yours and and other people's out there as well who, who have actually raised issues in the past and gone look this isn't for well, somebody who knows the industry this isn't up to snuff you know um but hey um, i have one more question before we finish up mm -hmm. it is a a period question what's your opinion on the christmas period right and when are you sick of it, if ever? I'm sick of it when I start seeing Christmas decorations in November. Yeah, same. Um, pretty much as soon as one... We're such a consumer-driven society. We really are. As soon as one holiday ends, the next one's decorations are up. Mm -hmm. You know, like Halloween was never a thing in Australia growing up. Mm. I think looking back on it as a kid, I would have loved it to have been a thing because you always watched American shows where it was... Mm. You know, and it's like, oh, that looks like so much fun you get to dress up and, you know, there's monsters on the streets everywhere, kids having fun. It's become a thing in probably the last 10 years in Australia and to the point where, you know, it's starting to really, people are just expecting door knockers. So they've picked up lollies for the kids these days, mm. you know, all grouches. Um, but as soon as, like, November started, that's it. Those Halloween decorations, they were ripped off like a stripper's pants and... There was Christmas lights out. And why? <laughs> it's like yeah, you're in November. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my patience was was well and truly gone. But I think there there are good things in the Christmas period. There are obviously bad things, like you know the minute that Mariah Carey comes on, mm -hmm. um, or Wham last Christmas. You know, gave you my heart. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's the good things. Like I get to watch um, Hans Gruber fall from Nakatomi Plaza. Yeah, that's you know, cool. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Every year. That's good. I got, yeah, got to watch that in the cinema last year. They put Die Hard on at the local cinemas That's cool. for Christmas. So Christmas Eve, I'm down there watching Die Hard. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not a Grinch at the end of the day. So mm. I just don't like the corporatism. Same. I, I think I think you, you echo my thoughts exactly. I think November, like my missus is, is huge into Christmas. And like Halloween's my Christmas for me like i love halloween i love everything about it I, I love i love autumn it's great you know and my thing on halloween and christmas and i've said this on the channel before i've got like a little analogy of if you're a, if you're a night person you know or sorry if you're a daytime person nighttime leaves you alone because you can either go to sleep or switch the light on and you know you're fine you're, you're great if you're a date if you're a nighttime person the daytime has no such qualms it will literally invade your room and wake you up, you know? It will shake you awake, and, and you've got to stay awake all day, and you're miserable. So for me, Halloween is nighttime, you know? It, if you don't like Halloween, it leaves you alone. Like, you don't need to, like, engage with it at all. Um, every store you go into, there's, like, one little section of Halloween stuff, and the rest of it's normal. Or like it is in the UK, there's one little section of Halloween stuff in the start of October, and the rest of it's fucking Christmas already, you know? And it just... Christmas is daytime. It is incessant. And it, there is this maddening demand that you be happy all the time. You know, that you be smiling and you be... And sometimes... And I, I've been around people who are very lonely and, and people with mental health issues. It sucks. <laughs> that time of year sucks for them. So, like, you know, I, I'm one of these people who... I, I have a big belief that Christmas is for kids. It should be for kids. We should, we should make sure every kid in the world has a good Christmas. Everybody else, you're an adult. You're an adult. Just, just, yeah, you know, spend some time with your family. 
You know, it's kind of why I prefer it in the States, where they've, they've got Thanksgiving, so you can have the family stuff, get that out the way, and Christmas isn't... It's a thing, but it's not, like, this huge... Thanksgiving's more important, you know what uh, I mean? Like, you know? Over here, it's it's rough. Like, we live... We're, we're two hours away from my wife's family, which is one yeah. direction. Another couple of hours, nearly three hours, to my father's side, another direction. Mum's other side of town, another direction. Uh, Australia's a big place. But, like, my Christmas day is equivalent of driving from one side of England to another three mm. or four times. Oh, it sucks. I hate um, to so see much. people who, you know, don't come and see you in the rest of the year. Oh, I can't fucking stand it. Yeah, that, that's, um, yeah, that's it. And and our Christmases are famously toasty. You know, it's mm. it's not unheard of to be mid to high 30s Celsius. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... You know, very hot days with long drives back and forth in in Christmas traffic and all the cops are out with speed cameras because they want to try and ping someone in because we have things like double demerit points here so you get done twice as hard as if it wasn't a holiday. <laughs> um, not that I've ever been done, Jesus. but that's that lingering threat wow. in the background. You know, Merry Christmas, of, yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. Just a, hey, fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and to me, it's just such a miserable event. And then, you know, you got to do all the niceties and the presents. I hate presents. I don't need presents. I'm a grown house man. Exactly, yeah. Give presents to the I'll kids. Yeah, exactly. Right? And people say, well, what do you need? You go, oh, cash. Well, cash isn't a real gift. I'm like, well, you ask me what I need. I need cash. I don't need bath soap. I have that with my mother <laughs> all the time. Like, she's like, what do you need? I'm like, uh, nothing. A card. A card and a nice meal on Christmas Eve. There you go. But, you know, so I don't have yeah. to cook. Oh, but you gotta want something. No, I, I, I'm a grown man. If I want something, I will buy it. Like I, will, I will save up for it and buy it if I want something. If it's something I need to save up for, you know. Um, what do you get? What, what is, what is that? My nineteenth pair of underwear gonna do for me? You know, you've just spent, and they're, they're overpriced at Christmas as well. Like they, they, they bump the prices up for these things. They know they're gonna be stocking fillers. So, you know, don't buy it. Are you, you going to sit there, like, really nostalgic over it? Like, yeah. oh, wow, what a gift, you know. I love Mom the ring that you're on the cock and balls on the front. Yeah, it's great, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're over. Yeah, we're, 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 Mac, we've done it again. We're over two hours, so I'm going to I'm gonna call the video. <laughs> I'm going to call the video there. Well, cheers for joining me, mate. It's been great, as, as usual. And, uh, again, we said we'd do more of these last time, and we've done another one. So, um, hopefully we'll have another catch-up pretty soon. And cheers for joining me, man. It's been great. It's been really fun. Yeah, no, a lot of um, out of left field questions I didn't expect. So that was uh, <laughs> yeah. that was good. I enjoyed that. All right, man. Cheers. And uh, go and check out Mac's channel, by the way, Out of Circle. Really, really cool stuff. He covers a lot of things that I don't. In terms of, we've actually got really weirdly opposite channels, haven't we? So um, uh, Mac is a very uh, hands-on. You know, looking at models, looking at games, looking at uh, everything that Games Workshop and beyond on the process of the actual hobby. Mine's more of a wishy-washy channel, so, you know, you can get a, a bit of both from there. Right, cheers, guys. See you later. Bye now.